Hey guys, we are live. Welcome to. Oh my god. <laughs> That was me. That was me. Wow. It was happy that, that you were was, early. That was, that was right on time. That was right on time. <laughs> Sorry for starting uh, a little bit late, but welcome to episode 14 of The Weekly. And of course, we have our usual host of characters, and we have lower thirds, people. Hey, look at that. Names. Yeah, so uh, it looks like they are making some fixes to Hangout Toolbox. Who knows? Maybe this will work. Anyway. They actually give a damn. <laughs> um, yeah, surprising. Yes. Uh, thanks again, again, guys, for joining. How's it going, uh, Sam? It's going great. It's going great. Hi, everyone. All right. Mr. Warren Bowman, what's up? What's going on? All right. Thumbs up. Let's do this. And finally, Mr. Juan Bagnell. I, okay. I just fixed my lower third. It matches the rest <laughs> of the I just had my name up there. You guys are like, I want my Twitter handle on my website. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, yeah, can you guys cool. hear me? Oh, no. Just yeah, um, I, I guess this this is a, a cool, nice to know, Warren. That uh, all right? Let's do this. Thumbs up. It's actually twelve years old as of this year. Actually. That that was amazing. I saw that. that it is, is the greatest crazy. thing ever. <laughs> greatest thing ever that happened. The Leroy Jenkins moment. And it's yeah. still funny as hell. <laughs> it's still funny, <laughs> as, funny as hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely is. Um, I need to set a reminder for like the twentieth anniversary of that and make. It <laughs> no, that would be actually what the twenty second anniversary of World of Warcraft at that point. God, yeah, man. how yeah. weird that is. Something like that. Um, uh, Juan, you get into Mr. Diablo. Juan, Mr. Roboto, Mr. Roboto is kicking. Mr. Right Roboto, is still awesome. All right. Lou, Lou Rod says this is one big rainbow of colors. That's right. It's the Power Rangers, baby. <laughs> Anyway, do we have a uselessness for the week? Because I didn't come up with one. Anything? Yeah, you, you did. Bought, if you bought oh, no, that's Snapchat not... stock, okay. <laughs> you <laughs> are part of the uselessness. Okay, it is. So, so I guess we kick into our first topic, which is also the major uselessness of the week. Snap uh, put up its first quarterly projections. They lost $2.2 billion. The company's stock almost dropped to levels at which it actually opened up uh, for first trading. And um, I believe this uh, Snap owners also lost a value of about a billion dollars or so. No, more than that. Oh, something like that. <laughs> yeah. okay. no, so they the lost, about, took... lost about $2 billion. Yeah, about yeah, $2 billion. The stock took what? An almost no, no, no. I said, I said the Snap owners. I said they lost $2.2 billion. In, this is what actually in happened. Year. See this? This is what <laughs> actually happened. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so so snap, snap, that describes snap everything. L. Two billion dollar loss, and then yeah. the stock took something like a twenty four percent dive. Twenty three point nineteen, yes. And and so it Good almost Lord. fell below the initial IPO for the company. Now, of, of course, with anything that's that's sort of based on the speculation of the stock market, it did rebound the next day when when I I did like a silly little streaming video test, and I was talking about the snap stock during testing my Elgato here. Um, it, it did rebound to something like 19, so down 23 to like 17, back up to 19, which is an okay recovery considering. But a lot of people were pretty shaken by a two billion dollar loss, and that the CEO was talking up there what was 150 million dollars in revenue. I know, yeah, uh, it didn't really offset much. No, I mean, there's there's a lot to to be. I don't know. First of all, why are people shocked? I mean, we told you this. Many years ago, this company has nothing. It's speculation. It's a market yeah. built on cool, on posturing. I mean, it's the same thing. Because, uh, have people... the most profitable quarter of any company okay. in the world, but to, they to still it... can have an investor shaky relationship if they don't hit whatever idea of cool the investors thought they were. Gonna I mean, have. but there's nothing cool to hit anyway in the first place. I mean, oh, let's oh no, 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 no. Having having hundreds of millions of teenagers using your service is investor cool. No, not when, not when Instagram can now do the same thing. Dang. Not when Facebook is yeah. pushing the same features out. So but again, it's, I, it's I not about. That. But it, you're, you're totally rational, Sam. But it's not about the actual <laughs> performance well, of the company. It's about the perception of well, the company. I, 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 well, I, I think they're finding yeah. out now. It's about the performance of the company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think. Yeah. I think. I think what really has happened here is that. Um, it, it's just going back to people are unsure how social media is working. Realistically, the only company that that's in the social space making any real 
money is Facebook. Yeah. Real and, money, they're making very real money. Real money. Yeah, they are. <laughs> it's just them. And realistically, nobody else. I mean, I, I, I would think if LinkedIn was on wasn't owned owned by Microsoft, that probably be even the other one that would make some money if they were on if they were on the uh the ticker um but everyone else twitter just kind of fondles around a little bit probably waiting for somebody to buy them up before you know at some point and then it just leaves everybody else and 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 it just it, it's proven that realistically only one company and one guy has figured out how to <clears throat> profit from these massive social networks that are created from free from f basically free entry and no one else has seemed to figure that out yet or and and i'm not sure if anyone else is going to i mean it's not a hard thing you see that's that's what my problem is right facebook but, no look let's look at facebook right facebook understood that it needed to grow it needed to evolve same thing with instagram snapchat has not decided as well as twitter to evolve from what they are, but the and problem is about the problem is is remember, Facebook is as essentially a social operating system. It's an it's it a it's a utility it's that no can be it's, 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 it's a utility that does several different things. That but at its core was designed to do it. It did one thing, and then you could plug everything else into it and build upon it. Twitter and Snapchat, those type of services are specifically one niche thing no true true they, they, they are else. but there is room for evolution which <laughs> but twitter where tried, no, yeah, okay. let, yes, let's, let's put, put it, put it this way twitter days. had where twitter had periscope and they screwed that one up i'm sorry but they that was had, a bad idea from the beginning to do that they had they had something that they could have used and they screwed it up because they branded it as something that nobody knew Twitter exactly. owned. But that's what I'm saying. That is that is exactly what I'm saying. You don't know how to actually grow your company. Because if you actually had an idea to grow your company, you would actually have people live streaming directly from Twitter and then use ways to monetize that in some form to, of fashion. You also, you also have to remember these folks are that are in charge of these companies that created a lot of these businesses are no older than we are. So I can think of it. Well, but yeah, I, but, but <laughs> it's a little bit different when you don't have experience to, to think those sure, so, so I think part of that, and getting back, getting back to Sam's but, point, I think a part of that is this is the culture clash between the developers of these companies, the CEOs of these companies who are probably younger than we are yeah. now, mm -hmm. and all of the suits in the room that actually have the money <laughs> who are throwing at these companies. And again, this is where a song and dance from Snapchat can look really impressive to a bunch of suits who don't understand the kids on the internet. But yeah. the kids are using this, so there's got to be some potential there, some money, some speculation. I, 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 I got to say this. And now these why, two forces are, are clashing. Can I say this? I don't understand why anyone would see money in anything teenagers have. Teenagers have any damn money. Their money <laughs> is their parents' money. So how right. where, where, where are they making money? Where is it that you think something that fits in within a, let's say, 13 to 18-year-old demographic is going to be able to make money from th those particular kids? No, I mean, there, there is money to be made. This always is. There's where? There's from their parents? What, yeah. what money are they spending? Besides it do, it still parents? doesn't matter. No, it's it's analytics, matter. man. It's, it's still money to be made from that. The problem is, yeah, but is selling data, yes, but I'm talking about what they're trying, what they're looking at is whatever a la carte and add on services that they can add to it to yeah, get yeah, people but, to buy but, into, but, which which is what those teens would get into. And when, well, but where is that? Where, where can they spend that? All you're getting is the data from the teens. And yeah, that's, no, that's no, but don't forget it. advertising. Advertising revenue yeah. did increase. Advertising revenue rose to 149, um, what was it, 149 million versus like 38 last year. Right. So it's, it's they, they are raising uh, money from advertising. The fact is they, they're just hemorrhaging cash because they burnt through what? Like almost as much money as they raised in advertising. Right. They burnt through already this year, 140 yeah. something well, million. They, they, they also quarter. don't know how to, they also don't know how to scale a company and not realizing that it's 2010 and you're listening to investors that are telling you how to build a company and to build a company in the 1990s, 1980s, to understand how internet and virtual office shit works and you can use, you don't need, you don't need this giant staff 
to run something that's virtual. You just don't need that. But they, but when you're burning through cash, prim primarily a lot of that is hiring people and hiring bodies. Uh, you know, because you remember a lot of investors like to see that they see that oh, you're you're hiring a lot of people. You have this growth. You went from 150 people to 250 people, and pe they like to see that number as as indications of growth, and it makes them feel better. But the reality is they don't need all that, but they spend the cash on that so fast ahead of time. And don't realize they, they're not counting on the business that's going to cover all that spending. You know, Snapchat and all these places should have gradually grown as they come along. And as they take the next step, you hire a little more. You take the next step, you well, hire a little I, more. I, and that's I, essentially I, what Facebook did, though. Facebook did that until they got to that one big point where they were like, all right, now we can full-blown bust this out and really become I mean, that. Yeah, because business. I totally agree because I think Snapchat also rushed their IPO. Yeah, the IPO issue is just oh, yeah. for the IPO. Facebook, well, it's a cash when, and dash. It's a cash when, and dash. When Facebook yeah. got to IPO status, they were a company running well. They, I mean, I, I, I spent time <laughs> looking at their financials. I got some good some of the financials before they went IPO. That's why I actually bought Facebook stock. If you want to buy any social media, buy Facebook because Facebook is valued at number. It's the fourth most valuable company on the planets now okay you know apple's number one google's number two microsoft's number three facebook is number four and the yeah. exxon number and that's, uh, and that's you know, to say that yeah. facebook didn't have a few teething pains after their yeah. ipo oh yeah, they definitely yeah they, 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 well, they but, but every but every ipo does every right. ipo does have but, that. But that, look that's at, I, I even had to eat a little crow i think they weathered that far more gracefully than i ever would have expected that company to be able to do and now they're an economic juggernaut yeah so, but but also again, I think I think it has to go back to the fact that at the end of the day, Snap as a company, unless they have a completely different product as Snap that they can put out that will aid Snapchat, because oh guys, they're they're talking about maybe doing a drone, maybe that could work. Really, right? really, I guess that's, that's one of the that's one of the rumors leaking out is that they might be looking at a drone. Obviously, spectacles that was super cool. People loved those things. Ah, this, yeah. was, this was a this was clearly a service they should have licensed out to everyone, yeah. and just well, been what back were you talking about? There. Facebook comes to buy you, just sell, just sell. There's certain companies that do things and throw money and pay way more than they should. The companies of that are Apple, Microsoft, Google. I, actually, Facebook. Apple does not does not spend that much money. Well, no, they steal, but they they will. They, oh they, wow! They, I like they, what they, they, no, 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 no. Oh, the Steve Jobs era, they did throw a lot of fucking money away, and that's been documented that they, they have. No, but their biggest their biggest uh, purchase was Beats. That was the most expensive purchase. And they, over, and they overpay for that shit. Yeah, yeah but that was it. That's the only one. That's Steve Jobs <laughs> taking a sack of money and going kamehameha to it, like he fucking does everything yeah, else. There's, yeah, but there's it, documented it, history you, of him doing you, that. That's why what I'm saying is you are actually I consider it wrong because if you want to talk about overpaying, Microsoft is the true king. Oh, no, they're the kings of that. And, I, you didn't let me finish. I said Apple's known for that, but Microsoft's the kings of paying of overpaying for shit and killing it. Danger, Nokia, probably some company that we don't even know about. They already bought and killed before we even knew it existed. It is all the same shit with them. They're, but if, if any four of those companies come past you and say, we want to buy you, they they literally give you a name your price option, basically. You name your price, take the money and go away. And go build something yeah. else. I mean that was what well, I was trying that. to talk about yesterday is it really is kind of a sad state of affairs though, is if you try to exist as a solo entity, you're probably just gonna get your features ripped off, copied, integrated into other platforms and you're gonna die a slow death of a million paper cuts. Yeah, they could have. They it's well, they could have existed. They, they could have easily existed if they had gotten ahead of the game and went to these went to these places that wanted these features and said, "Hey, we can build this for you. Let us license our technology yeah, because so, so we have that, it right." That, that, that I think it comes at all. The advantage. Yeah, that that I agree with is that we haven't seen that company like Meerkat. Where was Meerkat's strategic partnership outside of Twitter, which was its direct competitor? You know, if you built your cool on having <laughs> to use someone else's service and that other service has a competing product to yours, then All you're right. probably going to fail. So so let me give you a little inside tips on, on Meerkat because I met somebody who was handling the investment for Meerkat. And it's the op it was the opposite, opposite antithesis of what we think of suits. They understood the game. They understood that America had very few options out there, at least from where they stood at that point. There was the buyout option if somebody went to buy out quickly. There was also the fact of, of licensing services out. And let's just say the 
CEO developer was an idiot. Just call it that. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Pure idiot. Which is oh, why. Oh, like the Snapchat guy that had the chance to sell and he was the only motherfucker that said no? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. At least, at least in a certain degree, they've, those guys have made money. This guy is a pure idiot because where's Mercat now? It disappeared as quickly as Periscope came and flushed it down the toilet. Those guys are. Yeah, I think we've had this conversation already. When for, yeah. to building your business on someone else's platform, you're beholden to that person, basically taking that business model and just you know optimizing it for their own purposes. So yeah. you you end up with a similar product that's most of, most of the time better than yours because they have access to the actual true APIs for it. Yeah, so. it's very true. But yeah, so um, you know, I don't know how long Snap will be in business. Um, I'm not sure they've been there for a little bit, but it depends on what they do next. You know, how can they raise, how can they increase revenue? What kind of new products can they bring? If they call themselves a camera company, I have to see what, I mean, because that's what they went with, with the IPO filing. They are a camera company without any camera experience. Yeah. Well, no, they've got the spectacles now. They've got yeah, lots of experience. Man, that's, that's, aren't they coming up with the monocles as well? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, they probably are. Don't, 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 Microsoft, and when you just posted financials like that, nobody's going over. <laughs> yeah, oh, so, yeah, so I think that's that's and where he, they. And he was proud about the hundred and fifty million dollars. <laughs> he proud hey, about that. Hey, I mean, you got to rest your laurels on something, right? Anyway, but let's let's two move on. To, dollar company. <laughs> let's move on to dollar company. Oh my god, something else. Microsoft had its build announcement this week. Uh, a couple of announcements came up from build. We have Windows 10 Fall Creators updates uh, coming out in the fall, as you'd Perfect. expect. Um, um, you also have a new design identity called the new visual identity is Fluent Design, which is moving away from Metro. So Microsoft is going to be introduced. Can't that. call it Metro with modern UI now. Whatever it is, I don't care. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple of announcements in terms of uh, apps. Um, Story Mix is the editing app. Remember, did you have the video creator on, on Windows that they took away? Windows uh, Movie Maker. Yeah, Movie Maker, yeah. So this is pretty much the new version of it, or at least that would take its place. Um, also some stuff with mixed reality. And they had something that was really interesting called, um, kind of like, I forgot what it's called specifically. I'm trying to find it. I can't. But it's, it's, it's the ability to continue workflow anywhere. Timeline. So, Timely, exactly. Thank you. So starting up from your PC, you can continue on your laptop. You continue on your iOS device, Android device, either using um, any of the Microsoft applications there. So some of those features and some more improvements into OneDrive. So it's not taking up a lot of space on your hard drive when you're looking for files. It's just the files that you're using at that point in time uh, that does that. Um, then they also mentioned their the cloud-based clipboard, uh, VR controller. Um, so anything stuck out with you for Microsoft Build this week, um, Juan? Oh, um, yeah, some, some really interesting steps. I really liked some of the commentary I was hearing from the HoloLens team, especially some of the developers that were working on content for that platform. For me, that becomes one of, we were just talking about Snapchat. For, for me, that becomes one of the biggest opportunities for any company right now is to start looking at how we can get creative professionals and consumers alike away from a traditional computing desktop laptop environment so some of some of that content i mean if you go back through some of the the press releases and some of the uh the content that people have shot on the hololens stuff that that i thought was again still very interesting I'm hoping to see more hardware out in the public for people to start commenting on that development process. Um, and then I think we could see some really, truly disruptive stuff going down. I think AR has that, that potential. Um, but the more Windows-centric uh, announcements all seemed like baby steps in right directions. I, I don't know how your guys' experiences have been with this most recent creators update. Um, mine have been 
mostly solid. I got a little cranky about some of the uh, security and uh, privacy options just being reset for me, helpfully, yeah. um, that I thought was kind of bullshit. But <laughs> um, uh, otherwise, this was a pretty quiet build for me. Um, those are the things I was most focused on checking out. And uh, genuinely, gen generally positive uh, announcements coming out of the company, but I was hoping for a little more razzle-dazzle, and I didn't get it. Um, Warren? Um, uh, it's just it's just kind of a you know wait and see sort of update. It's nice to see these things are there, but I just want to wait to see that they materialize into something. Um, I'd I'd like to hear more answers on how how not to automatically restart my computer when you install updates. Give me control over those things. Don't. Yeah, I, even though I'm not the biggest concern about privacy settings, but make that a lot more clear in what you're doing in terms of tele te uh, telemetry and allowing people to set those settings as they want to would be nice things. Uh, there's so much that I would have rather heard from them other than, ooh, we're doing 3D things and we're going to give you a new created update to make MS Paint look better. Great. I don't care. Like Those aren't things that make me excited because there's already apps that are probably better than what they're ever or whatever they're gonna offer with it anyways. So I would I would just like to see I would have liked to heard more about also would like to hear more about how, you know, the Windows App Store is gonna go in terms of uh, more content is going to be and I know we heard that iTunes is showing up in there and the Linux distros are going to be showing up in there as well too. <laughs> which is going to be interesting stuff. But how like what what's 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 their development goals for Windows 10 S? And where is that going? Where is that heading? I thought I thought the I thought they really would have been focused on that far more when, than they were with uh, just kind of talking about extending the original creator update to do a few more things. And we have a stancy new design that just basically rounds edges around what we already kind of have. But you know, it, it hopefully we'll see more in the future. Uh, Sam. Oh, no, they have some pretty interesting features here. Uh, while their timeline feature is not really, I don't think it's going to be useful to a lot of people because Microsoft just does not have that um, hardware presence when it they comes also, to multiple devices. They also um, won't keep up with it. That'll be the problem. How many apps are going to support that? How many apps, how, how well will they keep up with the support of that happening? And it won't yeah. be. Yeah, true. Uh, but I think uh, the clipboard, which is something they really control, um, would actually be very useful if they can make it if they again if they had enough devices or hardware that actually um, use that the whole idea is you can you have a universal clipboard you take a copy of something on one device and then you can paste it on another which would be great if you wanted to say take a text a line of text that you're reading on your pc and post it into a chat app that you have in your uh, on your device that would be great except for i don't know that many people who have uh windows um you know that have windows phones no 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 windows it's a cross cross platform everything yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't matter it doesn't it's windows well, phone doesn't exist because they didn't, they what didn't I'm saying, shit about that what i'm yeah. when you say cross platform right oh yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's cross platform on Android. Okay. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> That's what I like, mean by, by cross platform. It's not, not going to work if it's only on um, on Microsoft devices. No, no, so, no, yeah, no. no. The, the clipboard stuff really stood out for me. But the other thing that stood out for me was the VR motion controls. I think that's a very good ad addition to um, to augmented reality. Uh, it looks very similar to what uh, Oculus Rift has, but overall, I think if you can have a good interface for people to interact with these objects that you see um, through your augmented reality visor, um, it makes it a little bit more realistic to people. And the more realistic you can make augment augmented reality, the more user friendly and the more um, the more you can proliferate it across, you know, different demographics. So that's that's a big. Those are the, those are the big ones for me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, for me, the timeline is the one I like the most. But I agree with you guys. Is whether Microsoft can actually build on that? Because for me, that's closer to the reality of what I want my PC to be. I want to. I don't want to actually. I want to be able to jump from device to device and continue my work, or watching a movie. You know. Like Plex, Plex, Plex does yeah. that for us. You know, if Timeline can do that for applications, I would be more than happy. I would be ecstatic. But again, on what devices? Uh, how many multiple Windows devices do you have? Like just, just, just no, no. Of? Timeline will also work on. Isn't that? Isn't that supposed to eventually work on iOS and Android devices at some point? I didn't see that. I know certain the, applications, yeah. I know certain the, applications. Uh, should, yeah. 
So mm-hmm. that is, I mean, that's that's my step to the future that I want to see companies do is where I'm tired of having to connect or feeling like I need to, you know, this incompatibility issues and things like that. I want to be able to move from stuff to stuff. The uh, augmented reality stuff also, I think for me was pretty cool just because I got to spend some time with the the Air headset, um, the Acer one at uh, the Acer event, which does not need any tracking to do any head motion tracking or depth perception, just like Qualcomm's uh, headset itself. And it was really good. And I was I saw an article that uh, The Verge put up that said, Windows Mixed Reality is great for Windows and bad for Oculus and Vive. And I kind of understand what they meant by that because when you're in the mixed reality, it actually works very well as a, for Windows, like for everything you wanted to do on Windows. It's almost like taking a little bit of um, HoloLens in and also you know VR at the same time. And the other two elements don't have any functionality in there. So hopefully Microsoft opens that up or at least those guys have some aspect to it. In terms of the creator update, uh, fall update, yeah, you know, that that is what it is, is there'll be two big updates every year. And uh, as opposed to Warm's point on 10S, I think Microsoft is taking this approach of every event has its, its focus. <laughs> I think that's just what they're doing. You know, 10S's event was two weeks ago. This is build for Windows 10 in general. And then, you know, we move forward from there on. So, you know, next one is E3 with Xbox, which Sam pointed out, those uh, Windows apps are not necessarily the same applications on your Xbox, yeah. this, even though they promised mm-hmm. that last summer. They promised the universal apps that aren't quite universal yet. So Yeah, of course not. <laughs> so, so that's the case. But anyway, let's move on to some other stuff. Uh, OnePlus 5, some more images, rumors. We talked about this. I talked about this with Warren on the Pocket Now podcast. Um, so OnePlus 5 looks to have a different design language from the OnePlus 3 or OnePlus 3T. Um, dual camera set up at the back and the front. Ceramic on the top part of the device, kind of like the Pixel. Uh, I was going to say Nexus again, but I caught myself. <laughs> you dork. <laughs> yeah. Um, it kind of looks like the G4 to me a little bit. Um, but what do you guys think of some of the things that are coming out with OnePlus? We know it's going to be announced in June at some point, just like last year. Uh, Warren? Um, I have to look, look, come back around to me. I have to look a little bit more at it because this is kind of my first time really taking a look at the specs. All right, then. Sam? Not a fan okay. of OnePlus, so okay, guys can move on. Yeah. Wow. All right. Um, <laughs> you, you want me to jump in? Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, so you're the only one left. <laughs> we, we had a, we had that chat. The uh, the design language to me looking like it's sort of a G4 HTC 10 pairing. Um, yeah. I don't know. We've never really uh, put OnePlus up as any kind of design vanguard. So I guess I'm not too surprised there. So if you were to take the back panel of the Pixel and make that out of a ceramic material instead of glass. You have some weird kind of two-tone thing, which is one of my least favorite things, uh, favorite uh, aspects of the Pixel. I think that design is abrupt, and I think it's not, I don't think it looks very good. Um, And then you curve the sides like a G4, and you curve the, uh, the bottom like an HTC 10, and you get the OnePlus 5. Really, for me, it's gonna be, it's less about the device. I actually really just don't care about the device. Um, we can be fairly confident that this is going to be another step in them raising the price, but still undercutting competitors with similar specs. As long as they're sub five hundred dollars with a Qualcomm eight thirty five and a Quad HD screen and at least sixty four gigabytes of storage, then we know that they're going to have their enthusiast base on board. What I'm really interested to see is with the second generation of phone, which no longer uses that stupid raffle ticket system, if they, they're just having a regular pre-order, a regular distribution sales system, can they get, can, can we see improvements there on them actually shipping phones out to consumers? Where the OnePlus 3 was back ordered so severely that people were still in line for the OnePlus 3 when the OnePlus 3T came out. And that's what I really want to see this company start executing better is 
that relationship with consumers. And once they have that in place, then I think it's time for that company to start looking at strategic partnerships with carriers. If they try and jump into a carrier partnership and they haven't sorted their manufacturing, then I think that could be a really bad misstep for a, a boutique manufacturer like this. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, Warren? Uh, yeah, pretty much what Juan said. I mean, I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of design. It looks uh, very familiar to all the other uh, phones we've seen out there. Um, but it's really going to come down to how they push this out to the market. Uh, not so much the specs and everything else. Is like, are people able to get their hands on this, you know, consistently, mm -hmm. easy, and and do they, they price it well enough? that undercuts the competition well enough that people will look and look to them versus someone else. Yeah, definitely agree. I think that is the biggest thing that OnePlus has to showcase this time around. And if they can do that, um, then setting up those carrier partnerships and moving forward. You know, like I, I mentioned on the Pocket Now podcast, I said, look, if OnePlus can come out and say, hey, look, I think if they're honest enough to say, we've got a million phones, OnePlus 5, right? Uh, this is what we can do. We're doing shipments of 100,000 every two weeks. Set that up and they say, look, first come, first serve. That's just simple. Come to our website, you buy. And then the next shipments will be at these time slots. That's it, done. And then you have like a three-month period of doing that. By that time, you've already started, of course, second your second, started, started your second um, production uh, manufacturing schedule that you can now ease that in and also now move to carrier partnerships with Again, T-Mobile is, to me, the best choice here, where you can launch the OnePlus 5 again on T-Mobile around the same time around the fall, where you don't have to get an iPhone, you don't have to get a Galaxy Note 8, you can pay $10 a month and get a OnePlus. I mean, oh, actually, 5 bucks a month would be the case for that phone, because it's 500 bucks. That would be a nice, you know, counter-programming or alternative to those guys out there. And I think if they play it that way, that would be the best thing for them. But is can they do that? You know, that's just the that's just the one question, and we'll just have to wait and see uh, what happens with them. Uh, is the dual camera even really going to be a selling point? That's 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 the thing I'm actually kind of wondering. Well, dual camera on the front or the back? On the front and back. It has both dual cameras on the yeah, front. Yeah, it's going to be a quad camera. It, I mean, it will be a selling point. I mean, it depends on how they use dual camera. If they use it like LG, yeah. I, you can see that, especially with selfies, wider angle, all that stuff. Yeah, I see this being sort of the combo LG V10, V20. You know, yeah. Having actual uh, dual cameras on the front for those super wide selfies, having an actual wide shooter on the back. I mean, my favorite dual camera is still the Huawei. Um, I like I, I like that the best. But if uh, if you're gonna do if you're gonna do different focal lengths, I think the idea of going wide is better than the zoom. That we see from the iPhone. Yeah, so I think it just depends on how it gets played out down the line, but it should be interesting. On and now, last topic for the day, at least for now, is uh, Moto X 2017 showcase with some leaked images, dual camera in the back, metal 3D <laughs> glass smart camera, IP68, AI integration, always on voice. Um, something charging, bio charging. That's what. It's, that's all I can read from you. Um, yeah. So, what do you guys think of uh, of the Moto X? You know, because Motorola has not really done anything uh, this year other than the G5, which is a nice device, but it's on the lower end of things. Any takers? It's a well, premium mid range last phone. Time. Someone else should go first this time. Right. It's, a, <laughs> it's a premium mid range phone. I haven't really used the Moto X line um, for a while, I think, except for the first one that came out. So it's uh, actually, no, I think that was a Moto G that I used. So it, to me, it's, 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 it's a mid range phone. It, it's not giving you specs that you're totally going to be, oh, this is so great. It gives you great battery life, 3,800 mega, uh, mega hours, and it's using a newer ish chip from Qualcomm, the 660. Yeah. So, so, to me, for, for what I do, it's underpowered, and it's not a phone that I would look at, but I, I can tell that there would be a lot of people who are looking at this saying, hey, it's probably going to be a sub. $500 phone, probably around 300 bucks. Um, it has great battery life. 
And if you don't mind the 660, if you think the 660 is going to do really great with performance, then go for it. Uh, Juan, what's in the um, key one? The 625. Okay, so that's so, a, so the 660 okay. is, is going to be replacing the 652 and the 653. Um, from what I understand, I think one of the big differences here is they're leaving the ARM reference design that, that was in the 808 and 652 to go with cryo cores. Um, I don't know that that's really such a huge deal. I think they're saying that it's going to be something like up to 20% faster than the, the 652 was. So we're talking Qualcomm 808, V10 territory, but hopefully with a cooler running chip. And a better LTE um, connectivity on there. So. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's that's going to be Qualcomm's bread and butter is, that, yeah. uh, is the radio stuff. Okay. But I just mean in terms of performance with these specs on here, it should be a fine performer. Um, I, I, I kind of feel like in that mid-tier, though, that I'm starting to gravitate more towards the lower Huawei. power chips to, uh, I love, I love. to improve battery life. So the 625 paired with a respectably large battery, I think is still a killer combo. Oh, the Q1 battery life is ridiculous. Oh, it's phenomenal. I, yeah. I, I, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be, I, I pulled the phone off the charger Friday, and I'm going to see if I can make it to Monday. Um, so that, that's, I, I would be maybe more interested in shopping a phone with a 630 than a 660 if I were already in the middle. If I want to go up to a more powerful chip, there are a ton of 820s out there that I can get dirt cheap, which will be handy competition for the 660. So I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn on, on this step right here, but I'm happy to see the Moto X being resurrected with, uh, with Motorola software features like the the always on voice detection adding just a little extra layer to to google now i mean that kind of stuff was i, I really liked that attention on phones like the original moto x and the moto x2 so i would like to see that company executing there again okay warren uh yeah i mean kind of agree with what everyone said here i mean it'd be looks like it's going to be a pretty good phone in the mid-range space um would be concerned on how well the camera is because that's always been a weak point for Motorola. So uh, I'd like to see how much better that's going to be. Um, specs are on point. Hopefully battery life is on point as well too. But it looks like it could work in the mid-range space. All right, cool. All right, any more topics, guys? It was kind of kind of slower topics this week. It was but... a light week this week. It yeah. really was. Anything else you guys want to chime on before we – or are there any questions? guys we will answer them for you yeah even the chat's been kind of quiet they're like yeah, no, yeah. thanks no news. thanks you oh, the keyboard is white yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know i mean like just kind of taking it back to what motorola has been doing and and since i was a fan of the huawei nova and that was the first phone i had with the a qualcomm 625 um i i am really digging these lower power experiments uh, I, I'm not really sacrificing much performance. I still have 4K video if I want it. I think, you know, Moto Z Play owners have been playing with this and understand it. Oh, really well. yeah. I just remembered something. <laughs> the Echo Show. Oh, yeah, that's right. That came out this week. Yep. Oh, I actually, <laughs> I, everyone else hates it. I actually did pre-order that oh, thing. Right. I, I actually kind of like it. I kind of like where it's going. I like having a visual representation. Of any any type of uh, voice command to give you. Cool. Let us know how it works. Yeah, I, I, bet you, I, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't be surprised though if this thing if this works well, it sells more than the standard speakers do. Oh, I I, I bet it will. I'll be curious to see though. If I mean, it won't it won't sell it won't sell, it won't sell more than the fifty dollars speaker. I think that that is that was where they they got their big break. But I mean, the regular. Uh, echo echo speaker. I think that it might probably beat that out. Um, I, I just, I mean, for me, I'm like indifferent. I don't like the design, but you know, if it oh, works, well, it works. Well, why it's are good. people hating on the design so much? I think it's fine. People just, are just hating on it. It match. It, it kind of matches with whatever the hell else their designs are within the echo lineup. No, it's not and that color I, scheme and everything I, else. I just don't think it needs to be that thick. That's all. I, <laughs> think, that, I think that's just the press renders, and then. Secondly, it has to it has to have its own base to sit on a tabletop properly, so you can view the screen at the right angle, and that's going to be better see, than better than using some type of pop out the thing little is, thing. I, like, there, there's a part of me that kind of likes the design, 
in a retro futuristic kind of way. Like I mean, that, if, it was, if it was, me, if you look at the Echo it was Show, it, retro future, like retro proper, I actually I'll buy it. Now it just looks like to me. It looks no, like no, 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 no. If you, if you look, good. if you look at the design of this, I can totally see this looks exactly like the little display screens you would have on Star Trek: The Next Generation. Where yeah. the idea of something futuristic, like, whoa, they have like flat panel displays and they're all like this thick. You what, know? What, it's yeah. not really what, like a laptop screen. What, what's it called like, again? Echo Show. Yeah, Echo Show. I'm just taking a look and at so it. So we've yeah. got this like wedge design that totally looks like it belongs on Captain Picard's, you know, ready room it, desk. I think, yeah, I, think I think it is on his ready room desk. It, I mean, if it only had that weird lumpy front part that it, that allowed it to swivel. Like it's a lazy Susan built into yeah, yeah. a touch screen. It would be that would be on point. Um, but I, I, I mean, I, I see sort of both points. I don't think Amazon's going for retro futuristic. I think this is like I would see not, now you mentioned it. Now you mentioned. I wish they made it a little retro, just a little, or at least offered a retro one. I would get the retro one. I would I would get the Star Trek next. Just actually exactly. exactly. The, that's that's the only that's the only time you will get me to buy it and be like, and then I can. Do what Sam did and just rename it computer <laughs> and say, computer, call Sam. And it would just call. And, and it won't <laughs> recognize your voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, did you guys hear about the NHS cyber attack? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that, that's, that's crazy. It's like a ransom. Yeah. <laughs> Another attack. Yeah. But this, is, this has spread to 99 countries. So this, yeah. you're saying this is the biggest ransomware the the biggest type of this attack that has happened in the world so far so yeah so um this is, this is ridiculous uh i'll say was doing that with, at work the, yesterday he sent me a message he's like yeah since <laughs> uh <laughs> since uh our head office is in europe a couple of things are shut down and we have to deal with this now <laughs> at this point <laughs> so yeah it's uh, it was pretty big now is this is this one this ransomware was this built on some nsa tool or, yeah, yeah, or, it, it's, it's built on the NSA too. Yeah, what is, is it called? Word. WannaCrypt. Mm -hmm. I think it's yeah. I think it's called um, basically the way it was turned off was someone registering a name at uh, called WannaCrypt or wanted to crypt or something like that. But I think the tool itself. I was looking for the name of the tool. I think it's, it's like Vloop or something like that. I, I, I uh, look I for it there. Okay, we have a couple of questions. Sure. Jake Jop one two three says. When are we going to have truly universal phones, CDMA or GSM? I mean, neither. Oh, it's not going to be CDMA. But neither. I, it's called LTE. Neither. Well, and, and also, I don't, I don't what, think we're going to. Uh, voice over uh, LTE. I, That's yeah, where it's all going. I, like, I, I, don't think, I don't think we're going to see any sort of truly universal. Because the problem isn't necessarily the technology, it's also the bands. Yeah. So I think we're always going to have some division from carriers and from services to say, like, Oh, if you have your AT&T phone, you can't use it on Sprint or Verizon or T-Mobile because that's the illusion of competition. It's not real competition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, they, everything will be voiced over LT. Then at that point, they, they they theoretically won't be able to block anything. They just they, they theoretically will still buy from a company have the preloaded software in. But if you want to go someplace else, it'll be very easy to do so. Okay, cool. Um, next question is, do you guys think manufacturers should just make truly unlocked phones and stop pandering to carriers since contracts are done for uh, at carriers at this point? Oh, we are. We're getting there. I mean, you just, you just got to have the weight to do it. Samsung finally put the fuck you down on all the carriers, but that took almost seven years to pull that off. Apple could do that because they came in a weight ahead of time uh, to, to be able to pull that number. Um, other carriers, other people will... I don't... I would say maybe one or two, one more might be able to get that. But by the time that one person, that one other company gets to be able to kind of say, screw the carriers and go, everything is just truly unlocked. Everyone will be truly unlocked at that point. So I, I, I it, it's coming, but right now the problem is you got to have that weight to be able to do it. And, and they know carriers, know Samsung phones and Apple phones sell services with people online yeah and 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 if you carry the weight that says that they have to bow to you so i i don't see that happening for anyone else anytime soon i think we'll get to one more person before it just turns into whatever but uh I, for, for, for right now it's just uh, it's, it's all about what weight you can work with 
Okay, cool. Uh, I think I think Nobody that's, else? Nobody else uh, that's pretty much it in terms of questions. No one else. Um, Maybe yeah. if I was unmuted, that would be great. Um, you had a little background. <laughs> had a little background so basically, I would say if you were, if we remove adwares from a phone, it would be a great start to that whole process to basically start owning our own devices, even if they're still quote unquote owned by these conglomerates or ISPs. If we can start owning the actual apps on our phones, it would be a great start. You know, I'm buying a phone and I'm not going to see Sprint's TV service on it or at t service on it or Verizon's TV service on it. That would really be a company. I, th I, th I think the only the only the only right workaround direction. with that is if you're paying for the phone fully off the bat. Sure. If you aren't you, I'm sorry, you're leasing it. So you might as well do. Well, well Amazon, remember, Amazon does that with their products versus yeah. paying one price versus another. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. If you're paying fully, sure. If you're paying it's, monthly, but right now, whether you pay fully or not, you still have to deal with this. Oh yeah, no, that's what I said. Adware's on there. Yeah, yeah unless so. you buy it unlocked directly from Samsung. Or and then, and, and then the unlocked phones have got to get better software updates as well too, a little bit faster than, than what yeah. the carriers get. No, no, unlocked phones get faster than the carriers. No, they don't. No, Sam, really. Samsung's no. last uh, with the S7, it took a while before. I think it's just getting nougat now. Yeah, yep. yes, now for the unlocked version, the carrier versions actually got it first. Oh, wow, uh, that's Samsung's problem. But so th th there are a few steps that we need to go through to get to that point where we can just say, Hey, we'll just buy our phones and that'd be great. It'd be nice if we if we could just buy it and use it anywhere, that's fine. But if we still had the adware on it, it fits the whole purpose. I mean, true, but the people who are complaining about that is us. Let's be frank, most people can't afford to just buy phones like that, and that's why the Ten dollar monthly service. I don't think a lot of people are complaining about the services. And that actually, that actually, a lot of people to get newer phones. Fabulous. Yeah, exactly. So, it really, it's, it's a problem that four of us here face that we want want to get rid of. But for that, but that's that's not even a problem. That's just an actual preference. Yeah. So, want to want the carrier stuff so, so the general, it. the general, I think the general public, yeah, uh, don't mind. I really think I, I'm, I, I think I've heard from anyone specifically who said. You know, why do I have this T-Mobile app or this AT&T app here? Because their mindset is I'm getting AT&T and T-Mobile. So, you know, having the AT&T customer service app or the AT&T billing app or the AT&T now direct TV app. <laughs> yeah, but you see, the, the thing is this, we're talking about actual having hardware ownership, right? So to get to a point where people are thinking of the hardware as being owned by a customer rather than being owned by the company, we need to start treating the, the basically the UI. We need to start treating the environments or no. just the, no, the I, user I, experience well, well, but, but, as but being the owned is, by the customer. But the, but the, I, I hear you. But the thing is, but hear you. But the thing is, we did that before. Before we under contracts, we did own the damn phones, and it really people were complaining about spending the cost on that versus being unlocked and being going where the hell they want to go. I don't think people care about owning phone zones and hardware that don't last long enough for them to give a damn about it because by well, the time they get by, by most people by the time they are paid off with their phone they have i think i think they're ready to so, upgrade so first, to the next phone by then so first of all i think i think there's a danger in trying to say for most people because the stats on average smartphone ownership are increasing um we're, we're seeing people holding onto their phones longer and longer and longer and i think a part of this is for general consumers if we're going to try and paint trends um, looking at those averages, even if someone is in a position to flip their phone more frequently, it's kind of a pain in the ass. I, you know, like I think there's, I, I think we we shouldn't discount the sort of momentum of someone on a device that they know, even if it's starting to underperform, the battery doesn't last as long, the software is starting to get choppy, even on an iPhone, like you can go three years and those software updates start to really tank your performance. But there's a there's a hurdle you need to get over before someone is going to want to take the time to set up a new phone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's contributing. Uh, I, like, this is why I keep saying, like, I think we're seeing those trends from the death of contracts. Mm -hmm. It's going to take multiple years still to get consumers out of the idea of the two year phone flip yeah, yeah. of the two year contract. And even though we don't have well, contracts, we have these zero interest loans, which take <laughs> around two years for someone to pay but, the phone off. But we're also that we're also getting into that actually existing over just having to buy phones. All right. Remember, people ought to be with about iPhones in many cases bought that straight up with the cash that was there. Like they bought it full price, whatever it was. So they are going to take a little bit longer 
with their phone because it it costs them more. I think once once if they go get a new phone now and see that it's a certain payment plan and they're told like, well, after this many months or if you paid it off at this point in time, if you're ready for a new phone, you can go and get yourself a new phone. I think people will be a little more willingly to do that. But I think what we what the case was, we had a period when we man, we just didn't dump contracts and went straight to uh, payment plans on phones. We sort of dumped contracts half-assed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> pushed off the so, phones I, and didn't really have that. There wasn't this loan. There, there wasn't these uh, uh, borrowing agreements that were going on. And it's also a case not everybody qualifies for borrowing games because it's against your credit as well, too. So if you don't qualify for that, then it turns into you definitely having to pay over a certain amount to get a phone. So that will, in many ways, make someone hold on to a phone a little bit longer, especially spent $800 fully on it. Right. Well, and also, I, I wouldn't discount the way that families might be rigging these metrics for us. So when we talk about phone ownership, like I have several, you know, friends and, and family members who they're buying new phones pretty frequently, but there's a trickle down in that family. Yeah. So yeah. mom's Galaxy S6 is currently now daughter's Galaxy S6 and mom has Galaxy S8, you know, so those types of things where people are actually holding on to these devices longer, but it's to take care of other family members to keep a stream of devices sort of moving through that household. You know, it's not that kids are just getting, are, are always just getting the brand new iPhones. You know, yeah. families can't always afford that, but there is sort of a secondary market immediately in the sort of nuclear family household. So there are a lot of forces at play, but also I think it's, there's there's been this, multi-year re-education process in what it is that you're really paying for, what what it is that you own, and how that relates to a, a, a device as personal as your smartphone has, is going to take still some time yet before people are thinking like, well, I could pay 30 bucks a month for this Galaxy, or I could drop $400 on this other phone, just own it outright, and my bill's not going to change at all. It, that's still not something that I think consumers have readily accessible because they walk into a carrier store and they're bombarded by the options the carrier wants to promote. promote yeah. But, yeah. but the, also the things, we, we don't have those those mid-tier, straight-out-the-box cost, cost phones are building, but they're not still building at a huge enough presence yet because they don't match... They don't yet match the offerings that the bigger, bigger manufacturers have and available. I think at whatever whatever point that this price meets up at, which I, I you know they can't be at eight hundred bucks. I think it's when when we when we get when when flagship phones finally get to probably somewhere around the five hundred dollar price point once building and every all that stuff becomes cheaper and there's a streamlined way to do this and be able to control the cost of that, or if the rate of uh, new phone purchases are a little bit faster. Yeah. I think that's when we'll see more people look at these devices as sort of not necessarily throw away, but it will be more, there'll be more than enough. Oh, it's been about six months. I can toss this and I'll get this next phone. And it's, it's the process isn't as hard or isn't as, no. it, well, and, and I think, are you there? Well, and, and I think your point there has definitely been a major consumer education point. I have a lot of people in my circle of family and friends who are questioning the value of a flagship phone right now. I, like one, just they'll hold on to their the phone they currently have for longer. But two, if they want something new, they're not running out to go and investigate all the various options in Chinese manufacturers. But I, I've met so many more people recently who are starting to consider leaving the team that they were on. You know, like if it was Team Apple or if it was Team Samsung, they're not going to run out and go and buy ZTE, but they've been more aware of what what options there are for their money than I think any time since I've been reviewing phones where Samsung and Apple have been able to dominate the com the, the commentary. Like even for yeah. my uh, my my sister and my brother in law, where two hip young college students working on PhDs, scientists, you know, uh, smart cookies and in setting up their household after they got married, like couldn't justify spending $1,600 on phones. So they went out and got Moto G4s 
and like could not be happier. Like they've become the poster children for, you know, yeah, it's not the flashiest and we don't really play a lot of games on our phones and these things do exactly what we need them to do. They last the day and like you know, we put in memory cards to offset the, the minimal storage. Done. It, it, it's, it's, also, it's also gonna matter more depending on how much more we do with smartphones and how much more we be, our computing processes become on those, I think we'll then vary out how much your phone's going to be or how much importance you're going to be in spending it into a phone. And I think, like, 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 I think we're still like, we're that killer phone away from all that changing. Like if, if, if Huawei had ever reached the honor magic here, which, which, which kind of bl blurs that line between being a flagship phone but being yeah. a cost effective phone at the same time and looks like all the other flagship phones. You, like most of most mid tier phones look like mid tier phones. You can tell it's the difference between the two. That was like the one phone you couldn't, it, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between that and something from Samsung or something from Apple. It looks good on that, on, on from a look standpoint, looks good on, 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 on there. And it has the specs inside of it to, to, to match it as well, too. But it's going to take that type of phone. Which is which OnePlus is trying to essentially do, but I don't know if they'll ever. Well, but that. but I mean, even look at some of the the recent gen, like I, I'm I'm very positive, I'm very bullish on a phone like the Moto G5. I mean, if we're talking about using a, a more premium look, using better materials, if you were to hold the G4 in one hand and the G5 in another, I think your general consumer would assume one phone was was significantly more expensive than the other. Not just this phone's a little bit more expensive because it's one it's one g newer i think if they were to hold them they would assume that they if they were released in the same year that the g4 was the budget phone and the g5 was the premium option you know without actually using them or turning them on um when we when we have more options like that i think we can get to a market where niche players can find significant success uh, and that takes us back you know a phone like the q1 the key one is going to be a really difficult phone to explain to mass market consumers. It gives off kind of a terrible first impression. And then the more you use it, the more you want to use it. Um, so if we can find a few more players like that, a few more name brands to start putting out stuff like that, I think we'll shake up the market LG. in the mid -tier. And okay. then, yeah, seriously, LG. But then after that, it's, it's about what can we do to actually move the needle on smartphone computing? I, I, like Samsung and Apple are sort of entrenched in victims of their own success in maintaining the same model that they've always had. You know, where are we going to find our audio phone from her? Or where are we going to find our AR phone? You know, where are we going to actually push into new usage, not just, oh, this now has a cards interface, but you still use the same apps and the same services, and you still touch a screen, and it occupies your site, and it forces you, all of your tactile attention to go to it. We need something different to really uh, disrupt this current model. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned that, though. Uh, you know, the AR is, phone is... is in, Zeus has those phones, don't forget. No, it's not even that, though. Like, to me, I... I I think a lot of companies have not even thought about the middle ground with AR. Everybody wants to build a, a pair of glasses you can walk around with and everything's powered on there. I mean, why can't you have it on the phone and still have the glasses and everything is just Wi-Fi direct? Yeah, AR too. really did start on your device. No, no, I know. I, 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 I remember I, I, a few years ago, Google had an AR game that was basically just yeah, device they're, game. They're, they're the precursors of Pokemon Go. When, um, Oh, Ingress. Ingress, yes. Ingress. Ingress, yeah. Yeah, Ingress. Yeah, but I'm just saying that, you know, when now the companies are thinking about AR and AR glasses and augmented reality, why not a dedicated phone that literally just pushes all that to the glasses so you don't have to deal with excessive battery power and putting everything in well, when, 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 I, when I say well, AR, that is what I'm talking about. Oh, no, I know. I'm just, I'm just saying that. I'm just wondering why somebody hasn't well, done well, that. Why, why, why do you need the glasses, though? Why, why even make that a requirement? I really think people look at this display all the time, focus on making AR experience work very well here, so that they get the idea of what this stuff is before you start putting it on other I mean, devices. That no, no, the reason well, why, it'll, the it'll, reason it'll I say the glasses, I mean, you read that, but the reason I say the glasses is, let's be, I mean, Sam, you had the experience with Lenovo when you went to the museum, right? Mm -hmm. yep. It's great if you wear a pair of glasses. You don't have to look at anything. You just look at yep. it and it pops up. Same thing while you're driving. So like, as soon as I get into the car, my phone shuts off and then boom, right here, I can now, you know, I'm saying that that should be an extension where it now becomes a little bit more practical, and then I'm less phone fidgety 
and more experience in my environment and getting more information. So you don't have to have a separate AR unit. You can have something that's complementary to it. Well, and so this this brings up a number of really uh, of, of really precious uh, smartphone design concerns. Is you know we, you need to completely rework notifications and UI and control. And and so basically, what you need to do is have a phone that can have a car mode, a glasses mode. And so that's kind of what I mean is like when I say that we need an AR phone, I, I think the first steps in that is going to be you still have a lump in your pocket. It's not that everything is going to live in your glasses. To start. Yeah. You okay. just have massive battery uh, issues with something like that. But in those daily interactions, social etiquette, ergonomics, things like distracted driving, we need to move services off of the phone. Yep. This is becoming a, a, a very uh, important talking point for me, but I think this is becoming an increasingly uh, sensitive issue as we kind of move into the next generation of media services, communication services, et cetera. So we've got our first steps. I mean, there is there are Tango devices out there. What's the um, Asus? The it's got something. AR. Yeah, Zenfone AR. So we're seeing those first steps and how you can get developers to create uh, world-aware um, content. But that also needs to come hand-in-hand hand with a change in how we interface with services and notifications and data. And I think if we're going to rely on the visual, we've got to get it up at eye level in a way that does not fully occupy your hands, your brain, and your eyes. We need to start reducing that kind of biological manipulation, that kind of biological um, attention or biological focus. Yeah, and, yeah but, but I, I, I think, like, think we need to change the way we do well, well, Especially I'm, for I'm, keeping I'm, your eyes focused. Wait, I'm, I'm going to say uh, that. Sam, wait, 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 wait. Sam, go ahead first. Go ahead, Sam. I was going to say we need to change the way we view our, our, our mobile devices, right? Because uh, the, the one thing you guys all keep mentioning is how we use mobile. But the thing is we're still limiting it to basically mobile being used as a way to drive AR or whatnot. We need to start looking at mobile as our computing engine, basically basically like a walking processor. It's something you dock into places to customize your experience with it. You dock it into your desktop to customize your experience with your desktop. You dock it into your car to power the computing in your car. You dock it into your work computer so you can get actual work done. You basically sync it up to your phone. It's your computing engine. When we start thinking that way and when we have OSs, that can be basically unified across multiple devices, then we can get to that point where AR starts meaning so, something. So you know, you, you, you hit the point of that unified multi or Somebody asked that, mentioned that earlier in the chat. We are not anywhere close to that. I mean, as sad as it is, Microsoft is the one who has even a better framework for it than anybody else. So no, 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 no stop, because that framework doesn't exist. <laughs> it, it, it is, and then they decided to fork it, and now Samsung's using Samsung DeX, and I have way more faith in that actually yeah. getting somewhere than I do anything with Microsoft's solution, because I'm pretty sure what they did in Samsung DeX was definitely co-developed by Google, and I bet you we'll see yeah. that in the next Nexus phone. Fuchsia. I think that's what Fuchsia might be. No, Fuchsia is just a piece of crap. No, dude, Fuchsia, is, it, Fuchsia's not even alpha yet. Have you have you seen the video of Fuchsia? Yes, so but it's he, not even alpha. Let's, let's saw, talk about multitasking on Fuchsia. Nah, look at the multitasking on Fuchsia. Just, just, look at it, how it, fluid it, it, it is. No, no, that's it's not because that's the thing. It's still limited. Fuchsia needs to be voice. I, I said this yesterday. Well, we Fuchsia, don't know what Fuchsia's, uh, the feature. I'm just saying that I'm going from what I saw. You're telling me how the multitask. I said, I don't bloody care because I'm seeing a bunch of cards. Bloody I don't want it. I don't want at it. those cards. As I being don't care about the cards. When That's you the turn it into desktop, mode. Okay. it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I don't at. care about don't the cards care. because it's a mobile OS. Yes, if I'm docking it, sure. But on the mobile side of things, I don't care about it. It might not be a mobile OS. It might be basically the multitasking <laughs> features we're seeing might be your Windows like your Windows multitasking when you dock it into desktop mode. You know, it might because look how fluid it is. Look at when you put like four different screens up, and it just gives you tabs. Like no, a I mean, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it has problem, but okay, you know what it is though. I think it's just me carrying my my calmness and putting an extent here. Is I want voice. I'm sorry, 
I'm so telling you, I wanted to just watch it. I want, I want voice. Had all the ranting yeah. that we I didn't voice start. to be. I yeah, know we didn't stop ranting. Then I'm great. I'm like, I want voice this control. Doesn't involve me or you for the first time ever. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I want voice controls. I'm tired of this crap that companies cannot sit down and work this thing properly. I want voice us- controls. God damn it! I want to say computer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm tired. Luke Picard's got that shit. Why yeah. can't I have that? No, no, no. Like, even John Luke Picard has that shit. I have it. <laughs> like food trucks are being operated by Watson. I mean, again, yeah. I mean, come on. Like, we have true. examples that are are ready. We yeah. we have consumer facing examples which are ready. If you remember the Watson experiment where they used Watson as a as a TA for a psychology course, and nobody noticed. <laughs> no one could meet with this TA. They could only email with this TA, and they're psychology students, and nobody noticed. Yeah. And yet, I can't get Google to dial my wife without giving me options for every single contact in my book that <laughs> shares a name with Marie, which is every single female member of my family. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what nickname I give her. It doesn't matter, like... Oh, I got one. Are you saying you have a Martha situation? <laughs> I'd be like, okay, Murmur, call Marie. Okay, there are five different people with the name Marie, and all of them have Marie as the middle name. And you're like, well, if I wanted you to call someone with the middle name Marie, I would have used Next their time, first name. Google will, have, will go, did you say Maria? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, so that's hilarious. So what, what's super frustrating is in the days of Windows Mobile, do you remember those voice actions on Windows Mobile? There was like a separate cab file you had to install to uh, to get voice uh, voice controls on yeah. Windows Mobile 5. Yeah. That worked really well. I mean, it was like this bare bones idea of how you could operate via voice. But I could, I could pop open my phone. I'd say, call Marie. It would ask me, do you want to call Marie Mobile or Home? And I'd oh, say, yeah. call Mobile. And it would dial the phone. Yeah. Now there's. Do you think so- it's a problem because of cloud? Because everything. I mean, that was. That remember, was all on the device. On the device. Yeah. Is, is that is that that that's the way the problem is? So, so a part of the problem is cloud, but another part of the problem is you've got this voice assistant, which is designed to try and be clever. So it's trying to help me, but not really listening to me. So if I try and issue a command, <laughs> Leroy like said, call it to wife. <laughs> I did. Oh, I did. And that, and that only works about half the time on all of the various devices that I have to carry throughout my day. The problem, a part of the problem here is that I get to experience every win and every loss with every manufacturer that comes down. So if, if I change it to wife, it seems to work fine on phones like the BlackBerry. But for some reason, it doesn't work on my Galaxy S8. That's a longer story. But when I say call Marie, I shouldn't have to, you know, oh, so this is part of the, this is the big part of the problem. I will say call Marie Juliet Bagnell. Mm-hmm. First name, middle name, last name. Mm-hmm. It will then search for Marie and find everyone in my contacts that have, has the name Marie. And so it will then say, oh, do you want to call Yvonne Marie, Christina Marie, Marie-Ev? <laughs> I have a friend named Marie-Ev. She's French-Canadian. It will put Marie-Ev up ahead of Marie, first name Marie, because it's trying to deliver something. And this doesn't seem to learn. So every single time I say call Marie Juliet Bagnell, it doesn't latch onto that. Like my bucket of data in Google has not advanced in knowing that that is a relationship. That is a person I call every day. (laughs) And and, and I think part of this issue is that, you know, when people design these phones, these connectivity devices, they forget that there are people in this world who are differently abled that need to use these devices to communicate as well. So what you're saying now that's frustrating, just imagine someone who is you know, differently able, they can't use their hands to to touch their phone. Can you imagine the level of frustration that person has <laughs> oh, on a daily basis? Well, and, you know? and to Ronald Collins' point, real quick, I, I will interject that actually Cortana did this a lot better. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cortana. Did. Cortana did this a lot better than Google now currently does, and that which that's is my frustration with Microsoft. Cortana and Connect would have killed it. Rat number three. We don't guys. have Connect anymore. <laughs> 
Sorry. You can continue. I mean, we're just waiting for Warren to get the fourth rant, and we have <laughs> rants just going from chain to chain. Because, like, when China so came out, and I was waiting for it to come on the Xbox, I've like, used it on my PC. It's very good, right? But the fact that I don't have a way of interfacing with Cortana, except for putting my, my controller connected to the headset, putting the controller in my pocket, and walking around, yeah. that's kind of weird. But with Connect, it would have been way better. It would have been a way yeah. for me to get, like, really cool integration with multiple apps on my uh, on my xbox it, yeah it would have changed the game but it just well and it, it keeps taking us back to what do we want i i think you know kyle ruggles in the chat had a point about this also being we can't rely on sight for everything yeah. that um audio is this major aspect that i don't feel has evolved as significantly as the fun pretty crap you know, we, like our phones are shiny and glass and ooh, look at these graphics and this this fancy material design and these sliding panels and transitions. And all of this time, audio's gotten a little bump here. Voice controls have gotten a little improvement there. Um, but we really haven't dug into the social aspects and the control aspects as well as we could have. And so also, um, Ronald made a point about Cortana on Android and it works well, but I don't have a consistent methodology to really launch Cortana across all these devices too. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, a part of this is, and I'm, I'm very upfront about the fact that a part of this is a major me problem in that I have one, two, three, four, five, seven. I have seven phones right now that I'm currently sort of, that I'm currently in active use. <laughs> so, you know, I shouldn't have to worry about which phone will remember that when I say call my wife, it will work and then for some reason, even though I have the exact same accounts loaded, other phones don't seem to perform the action the same way. And that's an ecosystem problem. Because you know what? If, if I have five different iPhones on my desk, I know Siri's going to be crap on all of them. <laughs> but I know <laughs> Siri's crap. going to work the same way on all of them. And for some reason, Google's uh, voice actions don't seem to perform the same way across all of these devices. Yes, Kyle, Cortana is on the outside looking in. I mean, they did, they announced that speaker with uh, Armin Carton and HP is coming out with one, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I would say super late, but there's still a chance to make boom in the market anyway. So they but, are kind of like in perspective with Microsoft and how long Microsoft has been in this game of making voice, voice. recognition. You know, look, they, see, they should be at the forefront of this. I, exactly. I, look, I want to come back to my apartment, walk in and say Alfred, and it says, good evening, sir. Welcome home, Batman. Then I will now say, turn on the lights or something. I mean, I'm just, I, I just want to have that freedom of me. Look, I've had friends come to my place and I go, okay, Google, turn all lights. I didn't understand what you said. I'm like, motherfucker, I said, turn on the lights. <laughs> 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 that, that's awesome because, like, you know, you, you, you have that really, like, I can barely understand what you're saying. That ask, accent is just undecipherable. Yeah, totally. So, <laughs> you, so but I mean, like, look at look African accents. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, I ask, I'm like, okay, Google, turn on all lights. And you still would have issues where it would just stop. But, but also, I, I mean, I, look at the frustrations that we're describing. I mean, if I want real AR to start walking in the consumer space, Project Tango is fun, but HoloLens is really the future that we envision. If yeah. I want smart assistants, smart digital assistants, more, uh, more organic search and voice commands and controls, Watson is the way that we want to go. And there are these two companies that have solutions which could be consumer facing. They could start pushing into these arenas and really disrupt some markets. And they're only focused on like the top tier of like corporate use. Yeah, and I understand that money is, is to be made there. But if you developed a Watson plugin or a Watson app and you made it server side, just like we're doing with Google now and with uh, uh, Siri, I think that that could be a massive market disruptor for how we currently <laughs> interact. I no, want no. a lot more than anything else. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. I, I know, Sam, you've brought this up a couple of times with uh, Braggy and stuff. Braggy, yeah. yeah. I mean, what? No, I, that, that I blame IBM. You know, I mean, what's in, like no vision? There is no yeah, vision at IBM. Right such now. a powerful tool that, look, you have no consumer side. This is your consumer side. 
that is your side that you could use Watson with those Chinese manufacturers, you know. Yep. You know, someone like uh, Huawei with the Alexa integration that was, you know, was terrible. Yep. Watson can come in and update <laughs> and go, yes, you know, we have a tool. Or even, uh, um, you know, partner with different companies out there. Bigsby, Samsung wanted to do Bigsby. Watson yeah, should have yeah. been your guys. You've gone and like, look, yep. we'll do this for you, man. You can call it whatever you want, but it's part of us. But I'm, I'm actually a little um, optimistic that, Bixby, because it has that dedicated button and that button has been shown to be customizable, might be able to launch other people's um, solutions like Cortana or possibly Watson in the future. So I'm a little optimistic on that one, that Watson could possibly come to a Samsung phone and you'd still be able to access it as a native voice control. Control, yeah. I mean, yeah, it is possible, but it's just, it's just frustrating because we have all this tech. It's all available. It's ready to... I mean, not not. It's not, of course, to the level of the movie Her, but it's it's at least taking steps there, the and right? and we can't we can't use them to full functionality of of having that. And then we also have the issue of cross functionality and pairing different things and and trying to use different you know different devices and connecting it all together. That's a whole different conversation. But just the fact that voice isn't up to where it should be, at least at this point in time, is frustrating. Um, as a whole, but anyway, guys, we've gone to our usual late time of one thirty ish again. <laughs> Even though we I had, I, I think we started off with a slow news week, and I think we wrapped it up with some some killer uh, conversation and some of this stuff. So I, I, I think it was, it was still it was time well spent. <laughs> No, no, I, it, moved, it moved from me to Juan to Sam for a little bit. We're waiting for you, and then. I had to we got to wrap it up. I had to wrap it up. Yeah, but anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Uh, so we get to that portion of the show where we talk about what we have in our channel currently and what we can expect next week and of course the last word from warren so i'll leave that to the last they can think about something uh start off with you mr juan bagnell what can we expect um so we, we uh we, we did a couple uh oh i don't have it right here where is it oh it's over here we did a couple uh, closer look videos on the BlackBerry Key One, um, a phone that has consistently exceeded all of my expectations for what this device was supposed to deliver. So not only do we have the full review, instead of jumping into comparisons, because it's so it's such an odd device or unique, I should say, um, we did some follow up videos, taking a closer look at battery performance and taking a closer look at the keyboard as it sort of relates to the whole Android UI, not just text entry. Does this really give you a benefit in other areas of the phone? So that's on Pocket now. On uh, YouTube, I'm kind of using that to do some experimenting with some new streaming options, some new streaming uh, setups, because we're still trying to sort our podcast problems for the Pocket Now weekly. Um, so I have the conversation up about Snap. And uh, I uh, also, I mean, we've been putting up some political stuff. I have more movie stuff over on VidMe, where another episode, we recovered another episode of Movies You May Have Missed, so that's up there. And then next week, I'm hoping to do some more 360 vlogging and uh, to take a look at the difference between some of these wearable speaker solutions, like LG's wearable Bluetooth speakers, and something like bone conduction, like what might be a better fit for entertainment and what might be a better fit for fitness. So that should be out uh, middle of next week on some gadget guy. Cool. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I, I guess I'll talk for Sam quickly because he has a 360 video, which I just haven't put up, uh, which is I want good. To put, <laughs> because I, I've been really stuck on what can we do with 360 that's not just, here's a 360 video of the ocean? Yeah, okay. No, the, 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 the. <laughs> <laughs> so before that, I need to talk to you about editing 360 videos. Yes. It's, it's, it's fun, right? Which, which I tried and failed at. I, I haven't even tried it because I, I went off-roading, and I have an off-roading video I'm going to drop today, but I did a 360 video off-roading, and I wanted to, to add that to Sam's, Sam's video, but it was like 45 minutes of off-roading video so i was like i need to chop this out yeah. somehow you know in there but um but yeah that's that will be coming up when juan teaches us how to edit <laughs> the <laughs> workflow, right now the workflow is such a pain in the ass oh, um God. So, so i did a <laughs> on, um, 360 on some gadget guy i did like a little office tour you know like just what yeah. the some gadget guy lab looks like <laughs> and as a joke i'll go ahead and spoil it somewhere in that video i have the door to my office open and you can see someone sort of skulk up with a knife. Um, only two <laughs> people caught it. 
So again, that's what's fun about 360 video is like, I, I, I spent all of the time and effort to edit this in, to comp in. It's a terrible comp. It's like the worst comp ever. You can see the line where I actually cut the door frame <laughs> out so that this person could like walk into the frame. Because it's me. It, like I didn't have another actor to just sit there for 14 minutes while I did uh, an office tour. But uh, the workflow from getting the video, getting the crop right, getting the comp in, moving these pieces around. I mean, it warps your brain fierce. And then the back end is terrible because after you render, then you have to do metadata injection, then you have to make sure it gets uploaded properly. It's such a pain in the ass right now. Oh, man. Yeah, because I tried using the, uh, the GoPro software, and that is not compatible um, with the uh, Samsung Gear 360 because the, yeah. the 360 view on there shows up as two different globes rather yep. than just like a seamless stitch so yeah, yeah so, so let's chat i mean for anyone who's watching this and it's it's not like there's some professional secret here the the camera capture captures h.265 in two separate circles yeah. so then you need to import it through a galaxy phone which will then stitch it together to get your rectilinear your full rectangle view <sighs> And then you can go through trying to edit. So you have to do a Wi-Fi transfer, which then converts it to H.264. So there is some quality loss there. The unfortunate part of this is even the Samsung Action Director, um, Power Director, actually yeah. made Sam uh, software for Samsung mm -hmm. for the 2016 Gear 360. That has not been updated yeah. for the 2017 Gear 360. So the oh. only way to do this is a near real-time transfer to a phone offload that file from the phone to your computer, edit it in your video editing software in that rectangle view, then finish your render, put it through the YouTube metadata injection tool, and then you can have 360 video show up on YouTube. And if you do anything, like if you add cards or you do any edit on YouTube, it will then lose the 360 view and take it back to just a regular yep. rectangular view. And this is why you haven't seen any 360 videos through me. I didn't even touch this yet. I knew it was. I just could tell. I was like, "This nah." I, I, I have some. I have some really cool off-roading stuff, and I'm like, "Yeah." So, so we we did we did an hour a ninety was it a ninety minute podcast? It wasn't. It wasn't a full ninety minute podcast. But the the <laughs> night after the the Samsung launch, where we all got you know gear 360s, we recorded almost 90 minutes worth of podcast that took a conservative estimate on the map that took somewhere around 20 hours of work not like the process was 20 hours and i was done it took three or four days to finish that podcast and over that no it was about three days and over those three days was 20 hours of actual man labor Wow. to to get that that video produced and a major part of that was also just offloading the files you know yeah, every single eight minute, minute, file eight, minute yeah. eight minute files had to be sent over wi-fi to a phone where the phone would do all the stitching and you can imagine your phone processor is super powerful right yeah. um when it comes to doing 4k uh you know 360 video stitching uh that that's that's what the the major one of the major hangups was and then i think the final render took almost a full day so i don't even count that as man hours because i went to bed i woke up you know thinking like oh i, sh I should i should be done with this render i'm just gonna go to sleep i've got the podcast in the morning i'm gonna join you guys for the podcast i did the math wrong and the render finished i think like 10 minutes before we were supposed to go live wow. and it was like a whole night where my oh, computer wow. was running, running at full at full clip to get that render done Okay, all right, cool. Um, on my end, I have the new Verizon Wear 24 smartwatch. Looks like the Huawei watch Gen 1. I'll just tell you that much. And i um, been using it for a couple of days, so I'll have a review next week. I also have a Dell XPS 27 inch all in one. That should be a review next week. I think I will drop my Sonos review and the Samsung TV might be the week after. So uh, on the current channel currently now, um, what do I even have? I don't even know. I can't remember. I have to check. Um, Lots of stuff. Yeah. Stuff. Uh, RX, 5, RX 580 um, GPU. Check out the review for that. It's very capable, well-priced. Some Mother's Day stuff, which you can still probably buy at Amazon now and get it in time if you need to. 
and uh, headphones from uh, Master Dynamic, the MH30s. That's pretty much it. Uh, Warren, so what's our last word? Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> Yeah. That's a good last word. Let's do this. <laughs> and we're done. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, definitely check out all the channels. Check out Mr. Warren Bowman on YouTube and Twitter. It is uh, Board at Work Doc. Wow. <laughs> hey, let's start this over again. Okay. Let's do it again. It's useless, by the way. How about you say Leroy Jenkins again and I continue? <laughs> uh, yeah, we're not doing takes, man. It's a lot. Okay. All right. All right. We're right, right. doing it live. Yes, yes. Follow me some on bw1.com, both on Twitter as well as on YouTube. And then Mr. Juan Bagnell, you can follow him on Pocket Now. Check out his Pocket Now videos. His own channel is Some Gadget Guy on YouTube, and his Twitter handle is Some Gadget Guy. Uh, Sam, again, is Black Iron underscore Man on Twitter, part of the Border World Network. Since we have lower thirds, you can see all those guys. And of course, it is uh, Thunder E here, part of the Border Work Network. So it's Border Work on Twitter and YouTube. I want to say thank you very much and always enjoy your entertainment. <laughs> <laughs>